Well, thank you very much, Martin, and thank you to the uh, Centre for Muslim Christian Studies for inviting me to give this lecture. Um, and it's great to be uh, associated with the exhibition upstairs. Uh, Twelve years ago, I think it was, that Ruth Barnes, who was then one of the uh, curators in Eastern Art, uh, put on an excellent exhibition on pilgrimage, which was an interfaith exhibition. Nothing that I know of has happened since then, but it's very pleasing to know that 12 years later, another exhibition which places the art of different faiths side by side is on show here in the Ashmolean. The area I'm going to be talking about today is almost exclusively around the Mediterranean, where the Arab conquerors of the, of the old Byzantine world, North Africa, the Levant and Spain met the Christians of northern or, or the northern side of the Mediterranean and the period I should be dealing with is up to about 1500 and I'm going to try and show you how material culture displays the hallmarks of collaboration or confrontation in different ways and the first theme I just want to look at briefly is conquest because the Arab Muslim armies conquered the uh, Byzantine area around the Mediterranean and of course Byzantium didn't fall till 1453 but much of their lands did in, in, in the 7th century and conquest leads to its own use of material culture and particularly architecture. Uh, Al-Walid, the caliph, the Umayyad caliph who ruled in the early 8th century uh, when he made when Damascus was capital decided it was time to put up a great mosque there and so he compulsory purchased the old uh, Byzantine church of St John the Baptist the Basilica which stood in this ancient pagan Temenos uh, or uh, holy area of paganism the uh, church, the basilica had been placed in the center here he had it then pulled down and built the great Umayyad mosque which still stands today so conquest was demonstrated by taking over a place of earlier faiths and putting one's own great building there to ensure that people understood superiority and if we look at the mosque and cathedral in Cordova, we see the same the other way around. Uh, Cordova had been an Arab uh, city since the 7th century, uh, but in 1236, Ferdinand III of Castile took it back, the, took the city for the Christians. The great mosque was left intact. Here it is with the later cathedral. The great mosque was left intact, though he did put a couple of chapels inside it. Uh, but in general, it stayed as it was until the 16th century, when under Charles V, this cathedral was built right in the middle of the old mosque. And Charles V was an educated and cultured man. He, co he commented, they've taken something unique in all the world and destroyed it to build something you can find in any city. So he wasn't very impressed by what had happened. But happened it did, and that's the way Cordova looks today. Another way in which you can see conquest very clearly is through the coinage. And the coinage of the early Islamic empire shows how, what you can do in order to assert your authority following conquest. The Muslims inherited the most common coin of the period, the Solidus of Heraclius from the early 7th century, which was widely circulated. Three royal figures on one side with crowns with crosses on, a cross on steps on the other side. And what happened under the Caliph Abdul Malik in the late 7th century was first of all, they removed the crossbars uh, and the crosses and they put an Arabic uh, testimony of faith on one side around the now uh, barless, if you can call it that, uh, cross on steps. The second phase saw the introduction of a caliphal figure on one side and an increased amount of Arabic uh, testimony of faith and inf other information around. 
But what actually then happened was from 697 the introduction of a purely epigraphic coinage, that is a coinage which doesn't have the head of a ruler or a ruler figure on one side, which had always been the case in the old world. There'd been no coinage hitherto which didn't, uh, but Abdul Malik decided on a radical re appraisal of the coinage and so it was epigraphic on both sides with Quranic quotations uh, plus historic information about the date and the ruler and so on. This was a huge change and it was only when he was confident enough that trade would continue with the new coinage that he could do this sort of thing because if everybody was determined only to trade with the old coinage then you were the, as a conqueror were going to look pretty silly but he was strong enough to know that his coinage would now dominate the Mediterranean sorry uh, along with conquest comes booty, because when you conquer somebody, you take everything you can, you pillage their possessions, and you take it back home, and it has a profound effect on subsequent generations. And one of the most famous trophies in the European Mediterranean, in the Christian Mediterranean, is the Pisa Griffin, which stands on the top of the cathedral in Pisa, there it is up on the top, this is a now reproduction, the original is in the museum in Pisa, uh, it stands there at the far, uh, uh, sorry, at this end over the apse, um, if we just go back to it, and it is thought to have been a trophy from the, uh, the conquest of the Balearic Islands by the Pisans, uh, which happened in 1114. Uh, this conquest is mentioned on the facade of the cathedral and at length in the sources, uh, but unfortunately the, Griffith, the griffin doesn't get any specific mention, so we can only hypothesize. But at any rate, it clearly was a trophy and took a prominent position to show the Pisan people how powerful they were, both in terms of trade and um, military might at this period. On the Muslim side, uh, Christian church bells were one of the trophies that Muslims took from captured churches, and in the case of uh, Morocco, we find them reusing them uh, as candelabra, or as the focus of candelabra, because here you have a central bell and then these brass sheets, unfortunately decorated now with light bulbs, uh, but they should have oil lamps attached to them. Uh, and this is the base looking up with the bell above. So this is typical of what happened in Northwest Africa. Another sort of trophy, we can find an architectural one in Cairo. When the Mamluks conquered Acre from the Crusaders, the uh, officers of state who were responsible for the conquest were ordered to bring back this Gothic portal from one of the churches there. It had probably been inserted uh, in about 1250. It's in the French contemporary style and it's made of marble and they then built it into the madrasa of Anasar Muhammad, the religious school of the ruler of the day, Anasar Muhammad, around about 1300 uh, in Cairo itself. And that stands as a wonderful trophy uh, showing the power of the Mamluks and their humiliation of the Crusaders. <coughs> Conquest, booty, well also of course people travel and pilgrims are very important elements in collaboration and confrontation, in this case really collaboration, uh, because uh, local artisans make objects which are acceptable for different pilgrim communities. And there's a lovely example of this uh, here in the Ashmolean, uh, on the left there, uh, is a pilgrim flask which seems to have been made for a Muslim client uh, compared to that below in the Freer Gallery of Art, which was made for a Christian one. Um, and you can tell that it's Christian because, sorry, that was a bad mistake, there we are. Uh, it has crosses on. This one, less obviously Muslim, but these motifs like the rosette and the double uh, rhomb here are found in early Islamic art and suggest that it's an uh, abstract type of style that would have been appropriate for a Muslim. And here are Jewish pilgrim flasks which have either the ark or the seven branch candlestick 
on them, showing that they were destined for a Jewish pilgrim. And these were all to hold holy oil or holy water, we don't know which, uh, and produced in Jerusalem in the 8th century. Which brings me to another area of collaboration, which is artisan, I've called artisans for all, because artisans are very interesting people. They make a living out of making objects, and they don't often worry who they're making them for, because making a living is more important than who you actually do it for. And so we find in Egypt, Coptic Egypt, uh, or Coptico-Muslim Egypt, um, the way in which artisans worked for both communities. This uh, looks at first sight like a Quran because it has the arabesque work, the geometry, and the uh, epigraphy, the uh, Arabic calligraphy, which we associated with precious Quranic manuscripts, but it's actually a Gospels. And the Coptic community are keeping their heads down as a minority and adopting the art forms of the conquerors, the Muslims, and producing their own works of art. But they're recognisable because this, of course, has crosses in each of those octagons. And there's a lovely example of this here in the Ashmolean, a pair of shutters. Uh, which are decorated with geometry in the arabesque, as you can see here, little arabesque ivory plaques within the geometric framework, but they have crosses, and so we're clearly destined for a, a Coptic setting, a Coptic church. Um, it would have been perfectly possible, though, for the craftsman, we don't know whether he was Christian or Muslim, to have put there the name of the Prophet Muhammad, and then the shutters could have gone straight into a mosque. So it didn't matter who you worked for, you just adapted your artwork to fit the bill. Well, the bill, the, the faith in that case. And you can see this in Egypt in the 11th century in Luster where, where uh, here on the bottom right we have a very secular scene of cockfighting that might have been happening in the, in the street as it were. Then we have a, a royal scene with a, a, a seated drinker with two cups in his hands very much the attribute of royalty down the ages in the islamic world and here we have a coptic priest so something that's very specifically christian all done by the luster workshops which were famous in the 11th and 12th century in cairo and indeed we have pictures of christ here in this fragment and more interestingly pictures of muslim uh, r holy or religious figures because this right hand one has the name of Abu Talib who was the uh, uh, father of Ali the Prophet's son-in-law um, and so is related to the Prophet indirectly and here you see a picture of him so clearly there were pictures of Muslim religious figures as well as Christian ones so the, Copt uh, the, the Luster community were working for both and we see it too on uh, inlaid metalwork. This is a wonderful basin in the Freer Gallery of Art in the name of a ruler of the period, a Muslim ruler called Sultan Najmadin Ayyub. He was a descendant of Sal Saladin, Saladin. And here we have on the outside of the basin, we have pictures of polo players, but in the little roundels above are Christian scenes. And this one on the right is a scene of the Annunciation, and this one, which you may just be able to see on the basin itself, is of the raising of Lazarus. So clearly Christian imagery was around, and Muslim patrons didn't worry uh, if they had objects with the Christian scenes on. And so again, you'd have the artisans using uh, ideas from both communities. And there's a very famous example of this in the Freer Gallery of Art, in addition to the basin I've just shown you, a canteen, a water pouring vessel with Christian scenes made in Syria slightly later than the basin. And this has Christian scenes all the way around. It has a virgin and child in the center. It has a nativity scene. It has the presentation of Christ in the temple and a scene here of the entry into Jerusalem. Uh, but it is uh, decorated with traditional Arabic uh, good wishes or prayers for the blessing of the owner. And on the back, it has a range of Christian saint figures in an arcade. And it seems to have been uh, used for 
a holy oil or holy water, uh, this central uh, hole would have held a beaker of some sort which you could pour water or oil into and may have been made for the monastery of Der Mar Behnam in Syria. Um, and it, this type of place was a shrine for both Muslims and Christians to come to and they, those who felt this holy oil or holy water was particularly holy would come from either community and this is the sort of object out of which it would have been poured. There's a very interesting example of the uh, almost confusion of the two faiths in a manuscript in the top capi, which dates from 1229. It's a manuscript of Dioscorides De Materia Medica, so it's of the classical tradition, but that was translated into Arabic in the early Islamic period, and becomes a work which is uh, propagated down the centuries. And two of the illustrations of plants in this particular uh, volume uh, have the signature of a Muslim, a man called Abdul Jabbar ibn Ali. But the scribe was a Christian, a man called Behnam. So here you have people of different faiths, presumably working in the same workshop, uh, but uh, they are working on, in this case, a secular manuscript. And the designer of this double page frontispiece has drawn on the Byzantine Egyptian tradition of two of the evangelists uh, offering their uh, gospels to Christ seated on a, a throne of some sort but they've modified that idea to make it look like Dioscorides with two students and they've put turbans on them and appropriate garments particularly this striped type of of, of gown, uh, which would have been understood in the contemporary Muslim world. If we look at architecture, we find Crack de Chevalier has some interesting uh, things to say. During the crusading period, Canon Vil Vilbrandt of Oldenburg described how in 1211, Syrians, Muslims and Greeks Syrians, by Syrians he means Syrians, Christians, Muslims and Greeks worked together to build the Crusader Palace in Beirut. And you find the way in which they worked together here at Krak and in another uh, castle nearby, Kalat Margab. And at Krak you have uh, plain vaults, as in this example, but you also have groin vaults. And here's a groin vault on the right. And in this case, the groins are structural. You build the groins first with centering and then you fill in the vaults between them with stonework and they support the vaults. Well, in Kalat Margab, which is nearby, we have groin vaults, but they've clearly been done by local craftsmen who didn't understand the principle. They built the vault and then added the groins underneath as decoration. It would give the impression of a groin vault and it would look authentic, but actually it didn't work like that. So here you have a really interesting way in which local craftsmen are using ideas from others. Okay, so that's we've seen in a way how artisans are involved in this type of collaborative venture. Um, now let's move on to a, another sort of uh, example which is visionary or perhaps strategic rulers depending how you see them and in particular we have Roger II of Sicily. Um, Roger created a bilingual state Arabic and Greek he had a bureaucracy which was based on Greek Norman and Arab models his uh, army was spearheaded by Arabs his navy by Greeks and as John Julius Norwich puts it, he died, quote, having created in a Europe rent by schism and exhausted by the Crusades, not just a kingdom, but a political and religious climate in which all races, creeds and cultures were equally encouraged and equally favoured. And you can see this approach in the Capella Palatina, the Royal Palace uh, uh, Chapel in Palermo, which is decorated, most of it, with Byzantine style mosaics, but it has a wooden roof, a coffered ceiling, which is painted and made in a purely Islamic 
style. So craftsmen from both communities working together to produce the chapel fit for the king. And you see here the interesting images. We have Christ in the apse, in the Byzantine style. We have Christ actually crowning Roger, dressed as a Byzantine emperor. And here in the ceiling we have a purely Arab view of a ruler seated cross-legged with a crown uh, but with a cup of wine in his hand uh, and all the tri trimmings, the uh, two figures behind him, of Islamic royalty. And indeed, if you look in detail, but you can't because it's too high up and it's so dark in there, uh, but the uh, ceiling has some wonderful little paintings of contemporary Arab life with a lute player, two, play uh, two people play two men playing chess, and a dancing lady. All activities which are associated in the Islamic tradition with royalty. Roger was an exception, but gifts and the taste for the exotic permeated the Mediterranean area and we see how objects travelled around, they were donated by people uh, to one another or give, given by people to one another and the European taste for anything unusual uh, meant that many of them were kept and revered. Upstairs in the exhibition you'll find this replica of the Chosro Cup from the Bibliothèque Nationale um, the original is in Paris, uh, but it's important because it's reputed to have been given by the Caliph Harun al-Rashid to the Emperor Charlemagne in the year eight, around about the year 800. So that's the type of gift which would have passed from one hand to another across the Mediterranean between royalty. And the pulpit of Henry II it, in Aachen Cathedral, uh, dating from 1014, is an important repository of these types of objects. It is inset with numerous pieces of hard stone, all of which come from the Islamic world, and include a number of chess and other gaming pieces, smaller items around, as well as a set of ivories which date from um, well, probably from Umayyad Syria. How on earth did they get to Aachen? Well, it looks as though they came as part of the dowry of the Byzantine princess Theophano uh, on her marriage in 972 to the Holy Roman Emperor Otto II. How she got them, presumably they were gifts to the Byzantine Emperor from rulers within the Islamic world. Anyway, they were inherited by Henry II and presumably to show his international importance as a minor ruler of a minor area of Europe, um, uh, he had them put in this pulpit to uh, presumably up his uh, self-esteem. Another lovely example of the way in which gifts travelled around is the vase of Eleanor of Aquitaine, the Queen of Henry, Henry II of England, uh, which is in the Louvre. And this has an early Islamic rock crystal body and then a 12th century Parisian mount. And on the mount we have a Latin inscription which translates, As a bride, Eleanor gave this vase to King Louis. Mitodolus gave it to her grandfather. The king gave it to me and Suger gave it to the saints. Now what all that means is that Suger was abbot of Saint-Denis uh, in the late uh, 11th, early 12th century and he actually writes about this vase. He says, still another vase looking like a pint pot of beryl or crystal which the Queen of Aquitaine had presented to our Lord King Louis as a newly wed bride on their first voyage. And the king presented it to us as tribute of his great love so that's the monastery, and we offered most affectionately to the divine table for libation. We've recorded the sequence of these gifts on the vase itself after it had been adorned with gems and gold. And then he puts in the inscription. And what's particularly interesting here is that Mitodolus was Imad Daula, who was the king of Saragossa in northeast Spain in 1110. So Imad Daula somehow acquired this piece of rock crystal, he gave it as a gift and then it gets handed down the generations and ends up in uh, the monastery. 
Another of these objects is actually here in the museum. This ivory lid from Cordova, dated the equivalent of 999 AD, uh, which, uh, although dedicated to uh, a, the crown prince in Cordova, where it was made, probably came from the church of Saint Servas in Maastricht. So it must have been captured perhaps, or maybe it was a gift, uh, but it could have been captured in the Christian reconquest and then gets given to a religious building. And there's an interesting uh, verse or two in the poem El Cid, uh, uh, the Spanish poem, in which Rodrigo de Viv of Vivar uh, makes a uh, prayer, says a prayer before leaving Castile on a mission. He says, I don't know whether I shall return to it in all my life, O glorious Virgin, says to the Virgin Mary, protect me as I depart and help and succor me night and day. If you'll do this, my good fortune holds, I shall endow your altar with rich gifts. So clearly people took vows and then the, the rich gifts followed. The reliquary of St. Petrock in the British Museum is another interesting example of this. Uh, St. Petrock, in case you're not familiar with him, uh, was a Christian saint and a prince who died around about 564 AD. Um, and he was uh, first of all, uh, well the centre of his cult was first of all in Padstow in Cornwall and then moved to Bodmin. I wonder how many people who visit Padstow for, uh, for surfing holidays realise the importance of it in earlier times. Um, the relics of St. Petrock resided in Bodmin, but were stolen by a monk, a man called Canon Martin, in 1176 and taken to Brittany. Uh, the prior of Bodmin sent a spy to find out what had happened to them, and with the help of Walter of Coutances, the keeper of the royal seal of Henry II, um, had a royal letter sent demanding their return. And actually, uh, Walter goes and, uh, to get them back. And this is how the story goes on. So Walter, Master Walter, the king's sigillarius, rejoicing in what had been said unto him, and at having received this mandate, departed at the first opportunity. I bet he did. Glad to get out of London, off to Brittany. Um, and as he came out, he met a crippled man carrying an ivory casket, which he was offering for sale. He felt that this was providential, and he bought the casket for the use of St. Petrock and ordered it to be taken with him. So this was a peddler's casket. It's actually a piece of Sicilian ivory of the uh, 11th century, and um, it became the, relic, uh, the holder of the relics of St. Petrock. Uh, textiles travelled widely, and here is part of the chasuble of St. Thomas Becket, which ended up in Fermo Cathedral in Italy. Um, and this has a, a bit of uh, attached material uh, with a quote about uh, the origin of it, saying that it actually um, was made in the year 1116 in Almeria. So this is a textile which is associated with Thomas Becket, and, uh, but it was in origin Spanish. Another of these is the Shroud of Saint Lazare, uh, which is divided between various museums in Europe, uh, the Musée de Cluny being one of them. And on one of the figures on this particular shroud, we have the name or title El Mudafar, the Victorious. And this was a title granted in 1007 to the governor of the Caliphate of Cordova, Abdul Malik. So we can date it to around about 1007. And it too must have traveled as a gift and somehow been acquired and wrapped, uh, had, uh, became the wrapper for the Try for the um, bones and the relics of Saint Lazare. So that's another way in which items moved and were appreciated and valued. Trade, of course, is perhaps one of the most widespread ways in which objects get around. And I'll just say a little about that now. You can see the importance of trade by looking at coins. If you look at the Crusader coins of Baldwin III and Amory, which were produced in the Jer Jerusalem because these were kings of Jerusalem, you find that the emphasis is on Jerusalem, not only through the cross associated with Christianity, but with the Tower of David image here, 
and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre image here. These are local crusader coins made by Christians with a Christian message. If you move to the coast, you find that the gold bezants minted at Tripoli on the Levantine coast by Christian rulers imitate the gold dinars of the Egyptian caliph al-Mustansir. Why? Because those are the trading coins which are most valued at this period in the Mediterranean and so the Christian uh, rulers decide to go with the flow and use a, a style which will be mistaken for the Egyptian style um, in, to the extent that these have phrase, phrases including the name of the Prophet Muhammad and the date in Arabic and so on which suggest that they are indeed um, Muslim uh, coins rather than Christian ones. Well what happened then was that the papal legate uh, in 1250 came to Acre and he objected very strongly to the way in which these coins reflected Islam and as a result Pope Innocent IV banned these coins um, and the legends on the gold bezants and silver dirhams were changed and here we have one at the bottom, they're still in Arabic but they have Christian uh, uh, words and Christian date on them. So the papal legate pulled his weight. But as you look around the Mediterranean you find that there are all sorts of objects circulating which take no account of faith uh, or political affiliation. They are found everywhere around the Mediterranean. For example, the jugs on the bottom left, jugs of this form of uh, probably made in Alexandria, but they've been found in Egypt, in Sicily, in Lebanon, in Majorca, in Spain. While the lamps uh, top left are also uh, widespread in Egypt, Majorca, and on many Spanish and Portuguese sites. And in, and in North Africa and the mortars on the right, the Spanish and Egyptian mortar above it, those give rise to a long tradition of Italian and Spanish mortar shapes. And these sensors, well by their fine spots you can see the way the, the idea is ubiquitous. On the right, Volubilis in Morocco, uh, here we have Crickvini in Dalmatia, here Gerona in Spain and here Amman in Jordan. So this type of incense burner is widespread around the Mediterranean and nobody cares whether you're a Muslim or a Christian, they're, uh, they're uh, traded in all directions. Gamalians, uh, Gamalia, uh, illustrate this point very neatly. The earliest Gamalion, which is the name of this type of vessel, on the left here is dated, as you see, to the early 12th century. It's in Innsbruck, but it was in the name of an Urtukid ruler of Anatolia. And this gave rise, this style of vessel, to the Limoges tradition of enameled gamalia. They're water pouring vessels, you usually have them in pairs, one with a little spout for pouring the water into the other. And notice the way in the French examples you have designs which are very, very similar, a central roundel and six roundels around it. Uh, you also have in this example a, a pseudo Kufic Arabic inscription running around here. So the whole idea has been copied from imported Gamalia. The Sitche Limani wreck. Uh, is a, a wonderful example of what happens to traders. Uh, it foundered on a little uh, just off the coast of Bodrum or just along the coast from Bodrum in southwest Turkey um, and it was carrying a, a collection of glass cullet. The traders who owned it and ran it and uh, were presumably on board uh, had an extraordinary boat full of pieces of glass which they were evidently going around the eastern Mediterranean collecting up glass presumably to take them to Tower or, si Tower or Sidon, the main glass making centres of the Levant for remelting. Uh, and uh, here in Bodrum uh, a group of uh, quite extraordinary uh, Turkish women spent years putting all the bits together um, and reassembling so we have an, ex uh, an amazing collection of glass from the Islamic world from the late 11th century. It also contained me uh, metal objects, it contained ceramic objects, it presumably contained textiles and so on which have long since perished. But it gives you an idea of the way traders 
uh, went round the Mediterranean, and indeed it has a piece of Southeast Asian uh, metalwork on board. Uh, this is a dagger handle. The dagger has corroded the iron, but the handle remains, and it has a design typical of Southeast Asia or India uh, of the period. So things were traded over enormous distances. Alexandria uh, was one of the key trading places of the Mediterranean. Uh, it was the source from which Cairo derived so much Mediterranean trade. It was the biggest city on the Mediterranean coast. And small excavations in areas of Alexandria have elicited an enormous number of items from different areas. Uh, William of Tyre in 1187 noted 37 merchant vessels from Genoa, Pisa, Venice and other western cities anchored there. But the Venetian notary of Alexandria, uh, who was there in 1404 and 1405, uh, lists as follows. Eight Catalan boats, two Basque one, uh, boats, uh, one Provençal one, 40 Genoese boats, one Pisan one, two Venetian ones, five Sicilian boats, one Maltese boats, two Ragusan bo boats, one Cypriot boats, and two Rhodian boats. So you can see the enormous amount of trade going on in the Mediterranean. And these wares, we don't need to look at them in any detail, but they just illustrate that point. They're from Seville, from Morocco, they're from different areas of Italy, from uh, Arabo Norman, from Sic Sicily, and, and so on. So they illustrate in material form the extraordinary way in which Alexandria focused trade. Uh, there's a very interesting example of another trading aspect here in the Ashmolean. These bacini, or bowls, uh, from the chapel of Agios Miros in Crete, dating from around about 1400, are on display up in the Mediterranean gallery. Bacini are exotic bowls which are put in church towers or in churches in some form, uh, mortared into the uh, structure, um, and which demonstrate the international links, the trading links of those who ruled at the time. And this is an interesting group because it has two Valencian luster pieces here, a Valencian blue uh, a piece here which is of manganese, uh, red copper manganese ware from Taranto in southern Italy, and then two more pieces here which are early incised slipware from Venice. So this shows again the trading links. And you can see them very clearly if you go to Pisa in the churches there. The Church of Santa Andrea, early 12th century, has such bacini uh, mortared into its fabric. Uh, on the east end on the sides of the nave and the church of San Matteo uh, which now has a museum full of this material uh, displays its wares wonderfully. Here are two examples of Egyptian luster ware which we've already seen one or two pieces earlier in the lecture. Uh, down on the left uh, are pieces from Mallorca, tin glazed wares here are pieces of tin glazed wares from North Africa, Ifriqiya, um, and you see bottom left a piece which has Arabic Kufic design on it, as well as one of the local boats. Uh, and indeed other pieces from either North Africa or Sicily. We don't know enough about the origin of many of these wares. But again showing how Pisa was the centre of trading uh, uh, arms which brought in objects from all over the shop. And these sorts of objects, ceramic, were not the only pieces that were traded. Trading also included metalwork and we find in the 14th century that metalwork produced in Egypt or Syria is being traded to Europe usually with a blank coat of arms which the European owner could then uh, embellish with his actual coat of arms. Um, here are two pieces with an Italian coat of arms. We don't know who it belonged to, but rosette either side of this diagonal uh, double line or fess. It's here again on this piece, uh, whereas this piece has three bulls on this central coat of arms. And on some candlesticks you can see the way in which they're left empty 
waiting for somebody to put the details in, whereas this piece has been filled. So these pieces were exported and then finished uh, in Italian cities. And you see this too in these Isnik plates, which are on display here in the museum, which both have this same coat of arms, but this time in colour that we saw two slides ago, uh, in colour with blue, red and white, but the two rosettes and the diagonal bar very clear. So these Isnik plates have been commissioned from Isnik in, the, uh, in Turkey, in Ottoman Turkey, and brought to Italy for the use of their patron. Another type of object which was widely traded was the, uh, was carpet, were carpets. Um, and we see this in Florentine painting of the 15th century, very much in evidence, though many of them, uh, you only see the edge of a carpet. Uh, occasionally you see the whole thing, or most of it, and this is a good example in a painting by Gelandio of the Virgin and Child, which is in the Uffizi. And you can see this very fine Anatolian carpet on which the Virgin, or in front of which the Virgin is seated. And when we look at it in detail, it has a Kufic inscription around, very typical of Anatolian uh, carpets of the later period. And it has two uh, star-shaped medallions, well it's a, uh, a rom, a dam and over a square really, um, as the field patterns. Normally, as I said, the type of carpets are you, uh, shown by just the edge, which is rather frustrating. Here's St. Jerome in his study, again by Gelandio, and uh, here we have the edge of another Anatolian carpet with a Kufic inscription running along. But many carpets were traded, and in, uh, in Fr Florence we find examples of that that have survived. And this wonderful piece, it's very fragmentary, but it has the coat of arms of Sultan Kite Bay of the late 15th century, and was presumably a gift to the ruler of Florence at the, at the time. Uh, but many other carpet fragments have survived, which were probably traded uh, in the way that the pieces in the pictures obviously had been. So we've seen trade, we've seen quite a number of different approaches, haven't we? Uh, I won't, uh, well I can probably can't even remember what they all were, uh, but we've seen Conquest, booty, pilgrimage, artisans for all, visionary or strategic rulers. We've seen a taste for the exotic and gifts, and we've seen trade. And just a couple more. First of all, art by adoption and adaption. Uh, in, a, in a sense, a lot of these overlap, and I've touched on this idea already. But if we look at an uh, early Islamic polycandela, that is the bronze items in which oil uh, holders were set and then you had a floating wick so that you could light a church in this way. We find that these were adopted by the Muslims but they were changed like the coinage. Um, this time the cross was removed and instead we have a pair of leaves and then you have other elaborate forms which don't bear really any relation to the earlier Christian style. But what happens here is that the bells which have been taken as booty from Christian churches are enhanced by these polycandela of different shapes or different sizes and different positions on the bell. And that gives rise in its turn in the later period in Spain to this type of conical polycandelon or candelabra with the polycandelon is now missing from this unfortunately but you can imagine that the light hung beneath here and gave out light through the open work. So this was adopting a form but adapting it as time went by. You can see this in the use of blazons in Syria and Egypt in the Mamluk period. Uh, in the wars with the Crusaders, the Mamluks had clearly seen the flags and the coats of arms of Crusader uh, leaders. And so you have them copying the fleur-de-lis of France, the Lion of England, and the double-headed eagle of the Holy Roman Emperor. And these are adapted, they're adopted first, 
but then the idea of emblems or coats of arms is adapted to the Muslim scene and we have a very different range developing which include uh, bows in this case or swords, uh, officers of state emblems, uh, the cup here of the cup bearer to the Sultan and then these complex uh, blazons of the 15th century where you have the cup of the cupbearer, you have powder horns and you have a pen box, a napkin, uh, these different elements all combined to form a royal blazon. So it goes off on its own route but the origins of this type of heraldry are very much in the Crusaders. And you see this same sort of adoption and adaption in the Mudeja period in Spain, uh, the Christian reconquest and the subsequent use ma uh, of many Muslim craftsmen to enhance the uh, Christian buildings. And for example, in Teruel, on the coast of Aragon, uh, in the early 14th century, we have a tower which, to all intents and purposes, could be a mosque minaret of the Western Islamic style with its uh, cusped arcades and arches, uh, this lovely arcade here, and it's inset with Azulejos, the tile work so characteristic of the Muslim uh, culture of southern <coughs> Spain. And this type of adoption is very clear in other cities of Spain, in Seville. The Alcazar, the royal palace, was greatly enhanced in the 14th century under two of the rulers of the day, uh, Alfonso the, I get my uh, numbers of Alfonso muddled up, but this was Alfonso the 11th, um, and his successor Pedro the Cruel. Now Alfonso the 11th had actually captured Seville with a Christian coalition from the Muslims, and so one can see his enhancement of the Alcazar, the, the palace, the old uh, castle of Seville, um, as a way of demonstrating he, himself as inheritor of the Muslim domains, and so he builds a wonderful uh, patio uh, with this terrific stucco work, these double columns with the athulejos, the tile work around, with the garden in the tradition of the Muslims and the pools and so on, the flowing water. Um, but his successor, who enhances the palace still further, Pedro the Cruel, had other reasons for doing it. He'd been brought up here. Um, he uh, was a friend of Muhammad V, who was responsible for many of the works in the Alhambra at this period. He'd used uh, uh, Muhammad V as an advisor. So he had a different approach towards the past. This was home. And so he enhanced it by simply building on the Muslim tradition because he liked it. So there were different approaches depending how you saw yourself and uh, one of his additions was this wonderful ce dome ceiling, an artisanado ceiling as they're called, in the Hall of the Ambassadors where all these small geometric pieces of wood are fitted together to give this wonderful effect. And artisanado ceilings like the tile work was very much a hallmark of uh, the uh, of Mudeja work. Uh, this is just another example from Seville, a late 15th, 16th century house, Casa de Pilatos, which continues the Muslim tradition uh, in the stucco work, in the uh, tile work, but has Renaissance features uh, like the goddess Minerva and these other busts around showing the mixture that's by then taking place. And here's another example from uh, one of these uh, 15th century Seville houses of a wonderful art artisanado ceiling, continuing that Muslim tradition but in a Christian context, but very much revering and admiring what has gone before and enhancing and embellishing it. And interestingly, this, like the tile work tradition, goes on into much later periods. Um, and uh, when I was in Aragon years ago, I was able to visit this parish church, Matute la Asuncion, and there we have in the 17th century uh, an a, uh, artisanado ceiling in that tradition in a Christian setting. Hispanomoresque is another example of the way this works in the Mudeja period in Spain uh, because the, with the uh, fall of the s uh, south of Spain to the Muslims then the Christians are employing the artisans 
to make their lust, them luster wares uh, in Valencia, in the area of Valencia. And so you have objects made by Muslim craftsmen, but for Christian kings. Here are the arms of Castile, this is a piece in the Ashmolean. Here's a piece for export to Italy with an Italian coat of arms on it. Um, and the Christians think nothing of employing the Muslim craftsmen and continuing their tradition, but very much Christianizing it. Uh, the, and the two, you can see them fascinating uh, through the artisan's work, what's going on. On the right, you have a piece dedicated to the Virgin Mary, which has the Latin uh, verse around it, Ave Maria Grazia Plena. But on the left, you have two pieces which continue uh, the inspiration of earlier days. This with the what's called El Afia pattern, the good luck pattern, which takes its name from El Afia, uh, an Arabic word, and it forms this type of patterning uh, and was commonly used well into the uh, Christian period. And even a form of the, the name of God, Allah here, or perhaps of the hand of Fatima, the prophet's daughter, um, here in this tile. So the two work side by side, and again we're back to this idea, you just work for your uh, patron, you don't worry about his faith, you just get on and do the job and make your money. But finally I want to end uh, with personal taste because this also comes into our equation. And nowhere more vividly than the uh, conqueror of Constantinople, Mehmed the Conqueror. Mehmed was an extraordinary man, most unusual. Uh, most Muslim rulers, and indeed many Christian rulers uh, who we've touched on, uh, really weren't particularly interested in the material culture of their opponents. Uh, but in the case of Mehmed, he was. He breaks all the normal rules. Uh, his his um, school book has survived in Top Capi, and it shows that as a boy, Mehmed was interested in European methods of drawing. Um, and that became clear once he became a sultan. He collected Greek manuscripts, including a copy of the Iliad. He collected sacred Byzantine relics and secular marbles. He asked the Venetians for a master builder and the Florentines for intarsia artists and other craftsmen. And from Venice again, he sought glassmakers and makers of chiming clocks. But most famously, he invited Renaissance Italian sculptors and bronze founders, an invitation which led to Costanzo, uh, Costanzo de, de Ferrara in 1478, making this wonderful bronze medal of Mehmed. Terrific image in the top with Latin inscriptions, notice, not Turkish or Arabic ones, um, and it was followed up by another request for a medal from Bertoldo di Giovanni, which I don't illustrate, but then a third one from Gentili Bellini, and here is Bellini's, dating from about 1480 on the right, uh, sorry, here on the top, uh, a wonderful uh, portrait again, um, and again with Latin inscriptions around. And Bellini, of course, was a man who also painted the Sultan. Um, and here is a famous portrait of Mehmet uh, in the National Gallery. And he also painted portraits of the Sultan's favourites. So there you can see there's a whole range of possibilities when we look at material culture, for seeing how confrontation and collaboration happen, or don't happen, the different ways in which they might mix. I think if I were to choose what speaks most to me, it is surely in the artisan's work. The way artisans work for both communities, indeed some of the workshops seem to have been made up of both Muslims and Christians working side by side. And there, perhaps, is where we sh meet people side by side working together for a common goal regardless of faith working together for a patron, regardless of that patron's faith. And that's something I think we can all admire in the works we've been looking at. So may I conclude by saying, long live the artisans.